Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third in a series of stakeholder outreach events that the Federal Transit Administration is hosting during the month of February to support implementation of the federal mask requirement for public modes of transportation. I'm Matt Welbus, FTA's Executive Director, and thank you for joining us today. Today's roundtable provides an opportunity for representatives from labor unions and transit agencies to share their experiences on implementing the federal mask requirement. We will host two panel discussions today, during which each representative will share successful practices and answer questions. Before we get started, let me just cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, if you missed the stakeholder calls we held over the past couple of weeks, recordings are available on the FTA YouTube channel and our FTA COVID-19 website. The Department of Transportation has also posted FAQs on its website, and I encourage you to review those general FAQs which apply across the transportation industry, as well as specific FAQs for transit. Uh, during our session today, we encourage you to submit your questions and comments. Uh, to do so, select the Q&A on the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit questions using your name or submit anonymously. While we will not be monitoring the Q&A during the call, our plan is to respond to today's questions and those we've received via email to our transit mask up at dot.gov email account during subsequent outreach events and by posting FAQs on our website. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce FTA's Acting Administrator, Nuria Fernandez, who will be leading today's discussion. Uh, Acting Administrator Fernandez is no stranger to FTA and public transportation. With more than 35 years of experience, she is an inspiring leader in the transportation industry. And Nuria comes to FTA most recently after serving as the general manager and CEO of the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority for the past seven years. Now, let me turn it over to you, Nuria. Thank you very much, Matt. And I also wanna thank all of our guest speakers uh, for taking the time to share their experiences with us today. Uh, you know, we have been on this journey for a couple of weeks now, and uh, you all have um, made it possible for us to share and listen to some of the concerns and challenges that the industry is experiencing as we're implementing together this mass mandate. Uh, the collective advocacy uh, from all of you, that's from labor unions, transit agencies, and transit associations, played a very important role in the Biden administration's response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. As you all know, on January 21st, uh, President Biden signed an executive order to promote safety during COVID-19 in domestic and international travel. And within a week, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, issued an order, which became effective on February 1st, requiring that all transit passengers and workers wear masks on transit vehicles and in transit facilities. The Transportation Security Administration soon followed with a security directive implementing the CDC order. Uh, TSA will continue to play an active role in collaborating with transit agency police and law enforcement, the local law enforcement, uh, to enforce the CDC order. In fact, we have invited uh, Sonia Proctor. And Sonia, thank you so much. You have joined us on various uh, stakeholder uh, calls uh, for surface transportation agencies here at the Department of Transportation. And you're back with us today to talk about uh, the enforcement aspect of this order. And to provide another tool to increase mass wearing on transit, last week, the Federal Transit Administration posted an amendment to the master agreement to incorporate the requirements of the CDC mask order into FTA grants. And why did we do this? Because we want to make clear that our role is primarily to increase mass wearing and that the master agreement amendment provides another tool so that FTA and its resources can support transit agencies in complying with the mask requirement. So all of these actions put force behind the executive order and it reinforces that mask wearing physical distancing, appropriate ventilation, timely testing, and vaccination can reduce the risk of, the tra of travelers spreading COVID-19 throughout our nation's transportation system and within our communities. So as Matt said, we have already held uh, two stakeholder calls and with more than 2,200 transit stakeholders participating. Uh, through events like this one, we'll continue to collect your questions and concerns through the Q&A featured and the transit mask up at dot.gov email. It is important to us that you have access to easy access to information and tools that you need so that you can implement the mask requirement while keeping your workers and riders safe. 
So that is why we're holding this round table today. We want to leverage the knowledge and experience that uh, you bring uh, from not only the workers, but also leaders across the country so that we can be successful. We also want to understand what are the challenges that you're facing, uh, provide an opportunity for labor and management to hear each other's concerns and to share best practices, because that's why we're here today. We want to learn, but we also want to work together and learning uh, what the other federal partners uh, can do to help. Uh, we as federal partners. So this is just one of several steps in addressing the escalation, best practices, and also to improve mass compliance. It is critical, uh, especially during these early weeks of the implementation that we hold these type of forums, uh, such as this one, because the more questions we get, the more prepared we can make everyone by providing responses. And my expectation is that within the next few weeks uh, or a month, that the number of questions will decrease because we're all doing and implementing uh, relatively good suggestions and uh, working together, not only with our local law enforcement, but relying on our federal partners to continue leading us down the right path uh, so that we can not only be compliant, but we can do so in a safe manner. So now what I'd like to do is to uh, introduce our speakers on this first panel and ask them to provide uh, some opening remarks. So we'll start out with Sonia Proctor. Sonia is the Assistant Administrator for Surface Operations for the Transportation Security Administration. Sonia, please join me. Thank you so much, Noria. It's great to see you. Thank you for having us here today. And um, this is a great opportunity. And you know, one thing that you mentioned, I think that is so important, and it's the working together that we've been doing to implement this executive order. And uh, it, we have uh, uh, published the security directive and in our surface transportation world, as, as you know, this is the first security directive in 16 years. So uh, for many of our partners in surface, this is new. And uh, so we expected that they would need more discussion and perhaps more guidance to make sure that they were fully implementing um, this uh, uh, security directive as it is intended to be. So the security directive was issued on February 1. And so we're now some 15 days into um, the issuance of the directive. Uh, as we started, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were working hand in hand with our security partners uh, to educate to make sure that they understood the purpose of the security directive, which is to prevent the spread of the coronavirus in surface transportation. That's our primary focus here. Uh, the way that we do it is with the guidance that's given in the security directive. Uh, we also sought to inform, to inform our regulated parties about the steps that they needed to take to comply with that security directive. And then to encourage, to encourage them to continue that process of enforcing the security directive, requiring the wearing of masks in public transportation to prevent the spread of the virus in public transportation. So our, our initial approach was educate, inform, and encourage. And, and I think we've been for the, for the start uh, 15 days into this, we do have uh, 26 uh, cases that we are going to have to review. Uh, these are cases that have been reported to our Transportation Security Operations Center. And in these cases, there is either uh, some question about the level of compliance uh, or some need to repeat uh, the requirement to the regulated party. So we'll be following up on those, on those cases. Uh, what we have found in most uh, of our engagements with our surface partners is that uh, sometimes they have questions about exactly what's required, whether it's the signage or the audio messaging. And we're doing our best to make sure that we give them that guidance because the first thing we want them to do is to be able to get the information out uh, to their passengers. So uh, we're continuing to uh, 
uh, promote the, you know, the focus of educating our, um, our um, surface partners. And we have also um, developed some frequently asked questions to help give them some guidance. And for those regulated parties that have acknowledged receipt of the security directive, which is what's required, that they notify TSA that they have received the security directive, they will receive an email that contains the frequently asked questions. If there are others who uh, would like to get a copy of those frequently asked questions, we're going to provide the link uh, to TSA Surface so that they may uh, request a copy of those. That's also the same mailbox where any questions can be asked of TSA about compliance with the security directive. So we have taken this as um, uh, an opportunity to help educate and inform uh, while in, in my role as assistant administrator for surface operations, those surface inspectors uh, do work for us. They are our responsibility in the field. So they understand this approach and uh, their approach is to make sure that they are helping our partners to understand what's required. They are, um, they do have the authority to enforce. This is a security directive, it is a regulation, um, but that is really a last resort for them because we're sticking with the goal of minimizing uh, the, the transfer of the virus within public transportation. There are civil fines that can be uh, levied on uh, violators. And uh, those fines uh, for first events range from $250 to $500. And for second offense range from $500 to $1,500. Uh, because this would be considered a violation of a regulation. Um, it is not our goal to find people. Uh, we don't think that's gonna get us where we want to be in terms of uh, getting mask wearing. So what we're really focused on is getting people to wear their masks in all of the uh, public transportation facilities. So um, we're going to um, share that uh, mailbox and that uh, link for uh, the tsa.gov slash coronavirus uh, address also. That's a good location for resources, signage, and also a copy of the security directive on the tsa.gov slash coronavirus site. And we'll put up the other one, which is a, a place where questions can be directed to TSA. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, we really appreciate your comments and thank you for again for coming back and joining us. Uh, you have a lot of good information to share. I am just going to put this out there for my team and see if we can create a link from our site to your FAQs and then that way we can facilitate uh, all of those who are participating and of course all of our grant recipients access to that, um, that whole treasure trove of information, uh, especially at this time when we're all just looking for all the best information that we can put our hands on. So now let me uh, turn to our panelists and uh, joining us are uh, today are Polly Hansen, who is the Senior Director of Security Risk and Emergency Management at the American Public Transportation Association. And we have John Costa, who is the uh, President of the Amalgamated Transit Union. Uh, Greg Regan, who is the Secretary Treasurer of the Transportation Trades Department of the AFL-CIO and John Samuelson, president of the Transit Workers Union. We'll ask each of the panelists to introduce uh, just a few brief remarks. I've already just said who you are, uh, but just a brief uh, overview of your actions in support of implementation of the federal mask requirement. And I'd like to start with Polly Hansen from AFLA. Polly? Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. And as the um, acting administrator said, my name is Polly Hansen and I am the Senior Director of Security Risk and Emergency Management with APTA. I come to APTA after 40 years in law enforcement, over three decades of that was in transit policing. And what we know is that from the start of the pandemic, public transportation systems 
have worked really hard to keep riders safe. And wearing face masks on public transportation is a life-saving measure that the industry has endorsed. Since last spring, some transit systems have operated under executive orders that were issued by their governors, which mandate many of the same requirements contained in the TSA security directive that Ms. Proctor just talked about. Agencies have been using education, information, humor, and patience to achieve high levels of compliance in the wearing of face masks. Agencies give away masks, they leverage their own in-house advertising networks that include posters, dioramas, bus cards, uh, digital displays, canned messages, social media, and YouTube. Um, at the request of the FTA, the National Transit Institute did create a course to help frontline employees uh, and agency trainers become familiar with the issues of transit worker assaults. And of course, we know the most frequent incidents are verbal threats, intimidation, or harassment. APTA issues awards to agencies who have developed model programs that address operator assaults, and we're currently creating a matrix of best recommended practices. We do know that effective mitigation strategies include using best efforts to gain compliance. And for that reason, APTA did write to TSA and advocate that the requirement that owner operators must deny boarding to somebody who's not complying, that that language be changed to use best efforts. Because we do have concerns about a conflict being created uh, between uh, a transit employee and someone who's not in compliance. So we do know that active listening helps, um, uh, providing an explanation, it's the law, you gotta wear a mask, I wear a mask to protect my coworkers, and to find a solution such as giving away a free mask. And then certainly you tell people what you want them to do, going back to the, we want you to wear a mask. We know that transit workers are professionals. They acquire CDLs and other required licenses and they're trained on how to provide high levels of customer service. And so the key is to project knowledge, to maintain the professional manner, which they do every day. And we know there are gonna be times when an employee has to act and that may mean calling central control, activating the silent alarm. Uh, Ms. Proctor did indicate that there have been some reports to TSA about security incidents. Not everybody does have a transit police and calling local law enforcement can pose a problem because generally these types of um, regulations, rules, even though it is a law or an executive order are hard for local law enforcement to enforce. So we do know that the CDC mask order is another step that will allow public transportation to be a key component in reviving our communities and our nation's economy, because we know that mask wearing is one of several measures that can reduce the spread of COVID-19. APTA has added a federal mask mandate page on our COVID-19 hub that has a variety of information that we hope you'll find helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Polly. We really appreciate um, your remarks. And in addition to that, uh, that you pointed out that the link on the APTA site for uh, best practices. So next, I'm gonna invite John Costa, president of the Amalgamated Transit Union. John. Hello, Noria. And thank you uh, for inviting me to this speak at this round table discussion on the federal mask mandate. I appreciate the FTA bringing us together and recognize the importance of sharing the experience of uh, transit workers and uh, the importance of this conversation. After nearly a year of fighting for and urging mass mandates under the previous administration that was rebuffed time and time again, we are very thankful for President Biden's quick response and action to require masks on public transportation. The urgent need and importance of a mass mandate hits very close to home for transit workers. You may remember watching the news and hearing about an ATU member from Detroit named Jason Hardgrove. When the pandemic first began back in March last year, Jason posted a Facebook Live video complaining about one of his passengers who openly coughed several times on his bus without covering her mouth. 11 days later, Jason died of COVID-19. The dangers of spreading COVID-19 on transit system is too, all too real for us. Our 
our members day in and day out driving tin cans down the road with poor air circulation. Every time that someone coughs on a bus, our members, their hands grip the wheel a bit tighter, knowing that they might have been exposed, including Jason. We have lost 132 members to COVID and with more than 4,600 infected. And we'll never know just how many riders and their family members have died because of massless passengers. Now that we have a mass mandate, the main issue becomes enforcement. Even before the FDA took this action, some transit agencies were already requiring face covering. Our members, the public face of transit systems, have been taking a beating over mass enforcement. Just to name a few, we had a baseball bat assault on a bus in California, a two by four attack in Texas, a bone breaking sucker punch in New York. Last May, a St. Louis man boarded a bus without a mask. After the female operator informed him that he could not ride the bus without a, fa without a face mask, the man fired a nine millimeter pistol at the driver. She was saved only by shields that were installed as part of the COVID-19 response. All too often, the burden of enforcing mask mandates has fallen largely upon our members as the mask police because the nature of our work as frontline workers. That should not and cannot be the case with this new mandate. The transit agencies and our employers must develop protocols to ensure maximum compliance with the mandate without placing unrealistic and unfair expectations on transit workers. In addition to the mask mandate, the transit agencies must continue to implement social distancing measures on buses, trains, and appropriate service levels to prevent overcrowding. Rear door boarding should continue. Transit workers must be supplied proper PPEs to keep them and the passengers safe. Proper barriers should be installed, improvements needed to be made to, for the airflow and air sterilization. This pandemic has taught us that all these measures are needed to provide protection against the deadly disease. I don't want to deal with any of my members being assaulted because I deal with it day in and day out with the fear system. So we've already been down this road. So what we need to do is work together and I appreciate once again being here. Thank you uh, for your remarks also, John, and my, um, my expressions of uh, condolences and sentiments to the ATU workers who lost their lives to COVID. Uh, they are, that they were um, transit workers and part of the transit uh, community and family. So thank you uh, for your remarks. I now want to move to our third uh, participant and that's Greg Regan, Secretary Treasurer of the Transportation Trades Department of the AFL-CIO. Greg? You. Come online. Here First you are. of all, I want to echo everything that my friend John Costa said there about um, the importance of this and the threat that every transit worker faces every day when they're out there performing their essential job functions in our country. Uh, it is unfortunately um, far too often where they're putting put in dangerous positions just because they don't have the resources or the leadership from their employers or from the federal government to be able to enforce these types of mask mandates. Um, we are thankful, very, very thankful that the Biden administration acted as quickly as it did. We, uh, we in transportation labor first called for a nationwide mask mandate back in July of last year. We, we formally petitioned DOT um, to implement this across transit and across other modes. Um, they flat out rebuffed us and said they weren't a public health organization, which frankly, I think was a dereliction of duty. And so we're very pleased to see the actions you've taken here. But I think some of the issues that were addressed by John and by Polly um, show the need for real, real strong federal leadership when it comes to the enforcement here. Uh, it shows that they have a really important role to play in making sure that everybody um, who operates and also who rides our transit systems are doing so in a safe manner because um, leaving this up on the shoulders of, of transit operators is not, is not the solution to this. Um, I think it also exposed some ongoing problems that we've seen from assaults that John mentioned earlier. Um, the fact that we do not have, there, there has been industry-wide resistance to implementing uh, things like physical barriers, de-escalation training, um, and other assault mitigation efforts that this agency uh, can take a, le a real leadership in, in terms of 
um, making sure that we develop the protocols necessary to have safe operations throughout our, throughout our country. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity here to not only protect people during this pandemic as it winds down, but to create a new environment and new rules and new leadership when it comes to safe operations and transit. And, and I hope that's one that, um, that, that, this, that this DOT and this FTA will take seriously. Uh, one, one last thing I would wanna mention here, um, as we look for ways to, to, uh, to improve the uh, implementation of this order and, and moving forward, um, there is money that's been appropriated now twice by Congress um, for joint labor management for, for, uh, frontline workforce training. Uh, that has been ignored by the last administration. It's an opportunity here uh, to take that money and implement it in a way that will um, provide the right type of training for frontline transit workers uh, in a way that was intended by Congress. And right now, having that leadership from FTA and having uh, the ability to move this initiative forward, I think will go a long way towards helping to improve uh, operations in, in, in this country. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Greg, and you, you're you correct. Uh, there is the funding and there is the opportunity for the transit agencies um, to be trained, uh, to train their workers. Uh, We'll be talking some more about that later. But now I'd like to ask our final speaker, uh, John Samuelson, who is the president of the Transportation Workers Union to join us. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. And, and thank you for having us. Yeah, I think it's a little bit difficult to go after John Costa and Greg Regan. I mean, we, we really all are in collective agreement about the issues. Um, one thing I do want to point out is, which also has been noted, the efforts by the trade union movement to reach out to your predecessors uh, and to Secretary Chow in particular have just absolutely fallen on dead on on just with deafness. That's been the response. So I think what we're doing right now today is it demonstrates in a great way the contrast between administrations and the contrast between leadership on behalf of workers. Now, just in terms of the 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 physical impact of COVID nineteen. The TW has suffered over 165 fatalities nationally, and 134 of those are in transit. So we've we've really kind of had the bit of bite of this pandemic and felt it in an up close and personal way. Uh, I'm sure John would uh, recognize this to be true as well. There's not one of us who don't know somebody that was close to us that passed away from COVID-19 um, in terms of transit workers. That's that's the the stark reality here. So. Um, just a couple of things that I think that have not been noted, uh, just to, instead of just treading over the ground that was covered already. Everybody knows that the economies, particularly local economies and the combined economies that really go a long way toward advancing this national economy, they're not, they're not gonna bounce back unless we have safe, reliable transit. And riders are not gonna come into transit systems where they perceive that there's a possible threat or a potential of getting COVID-19. So the mask mandate becomes super important on so many levels, on absolutely so many levels, not just protecting transit workers, frontline transit workers, but also on creating an atmosphere where folks that, that right now are driving their cars into urban business districts rather than getting on public transit will begin to feel safe to migrate back into the system. And, and I think that's a, one of the most important elements of what's gone on here. As, and, and also combined with the stimulus money, the, the huge investment into public transit where riders as they migrate, migrate back into the system can migrate back into systems that are in states of good repair and states of high reliability. So I, I think that this as, a, as a, a tactic of an overall strategy to address the problems that are plaguing public transit right now is, is really super. And we are thankful in the TWU that, uh, that it's happened. Now, I think um, the issue of enforcement has been touched on. And as I listen to um, the conversation, it seems to me to focus on, on, on passenger enforcement, on what are we going to do about passengers. But we're in a situation right now where we have systems, even that are on this call, SEPTA, for instance, that's actually taken a position with the TW that they're not going to enforce the mask mandate. And we cannot have that situation. We've engaged in industrial action in, in transit cities, on transit properties during the height of the pandemic, industrial action where we shut the systems down 
over lack of enforcement on mask mandates, where there were, which was also mentioned before, where there were governors, uh, various governors' executive orders. And so right now, the enforcement issue for us, it's, 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 it's more important than the rider mandate, than the passenger mandate, that these systems, I mean, SEPT is like the sixth biggest system in the country, that they understand fully that the federal government's requiring them to enforce a mask mandate. We, we do not have that right now. And, and frankly, I, I, have, I don't have talking points in front of me and any talking points I would have had would have mirrored Greg's and John's as well. But when a, when a, a system like SEPTA takes that position, they automatically put themselves on a collision course towards some sort of industrial action with the unions. And it's just so absolutely unnecessary. The president of the United States of America has ordered them to comply and they're refusing. Now it's one thing for them to refuse the governor of Pennsylvania's instructions, but they're now refusing the instructions of the president of the United States and they are on this call. And so this, again, this issue of enforcement is not just about ridership enforcement to create a safe workplace for transit workers. It's about the systems themselves actually standing up for riders and for workers to create a safe ride and a safe workplace for all of us. And um, I don't wanna take any more time. I'm sure I went over the three minutes, but thank you very much again for, for inviting us on. And again, the contrast between what's going on right now and the Trump administration is stark and greatly appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us, uh, John, and for sharing um, not only the broader national experience, but also talking very specific about regions. And, and to that point, I thought, that um, maybe we let's just start having this conversation uh, because I'm looking for you all to help us at the federal government so that we can help the thousands of transit agencies out there. So how can, you know, what techniques uh, can you all recommend uh, on the mask wearing? Where the, we would like to emphasize that uh, to wear the mask because that's where we stop the, the spread of the, the virus. Uh, we wanna deescalate of confrontations between operators and passengers uh, because we want to protect the operators and we don't want to put them in harm's way. Uh, Sonia, why don't, let me start with you because the, 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 the security directive uh, is one that you all issued. What, uh, what suggestions do you have? We recognized uh, the concerns that the operators would have with regard to engaging with people who are non-compliant with the mask wearing. So the guidance uh, that we've given systems is not to have the operators to engage directly, uh, other than to make an announcement, uh, which is a reminder to everybody on the, on, on the, uh, on the conveyance that they need to wear a mask but not to engage a specific individual to try to enforce the mask mandate, but instead to contact their control um, and then let the determination be made whether or not they need to involve law enforcement. Uh, we're concerned about the safety of our operators and uh, we, we do not want to create an environment where there's unnecessary engagement that could result in, uh, in an assault. Yeah, um, well, we have a situation where it's, we have the, the unions that represent the membership of the transit agencies, uh, the, the operator, the maintenance personnel and all the public facing people. We have the transit agencies and we have law enforcement. How can we, you know, how can we at the federal level uh, help those three groups to come together so that uh, there is uh, an implementation, there are practices that can be brought to bear. And I'll look to Polly, uh, John and Greg uh, as well. It's, this is about all of us trying to come up with a solution. We know what the challenges are. We know that the transit agencies vary in size from small, medium, and large. Not everyone has resources. Many of them are serving areas that are very sparsely populated, very spread out. Uh, so we're not going to get immediate response. What ideas can, what are some of the takeaways that you all can share with those who are participating, the 400 plus people who are participating today, and then those who are gonna be watching this recording later. Let me start with Polly. Well, I'd say a couple of things. And one of the things that um, APTA did advocate for early on in the conversations with TSA was having a national campaign 
um, so that everybody understands the reasons why it's so important and that uh, there are effective strategies uh, given out. You know, going back to Mr. Costa's reference to that um, video, that it's just hard to watch something like that. And of course, I think putting a, a name and a face to uh, the really brave transit workers who have been here since the beginning, getting essential workers to their jobs. And you know, that's why once again, there was strong advocacy for public transit workers to be in 1B for the recipient of the um, vaccine. Um, that said, we do hear that there are very high levels of compliance. Um, but once again, you know, one transit worker getting assaulted is one too many. And going back to what John said, we do know that that happens from the fare box with fare disputes. I think there has been a tremendous amount of effort. As I referenced, FTA has supported NTI in developing training. Of course, that training is best when it's done in person and role playing. So it's hard to do that kind of training, um, you know, virtually. Um, but there are techniques, and I think that our workers are so professional. And, uh, and of course, the workers themselves know the best strategies. And going back to what Sonia said, it is making the best effort. We do know that um, paragraph G does say must deny. And we would suggest that that language does need to be changed to uh, best effort so that employees don't feel like they have to get in a confrontation with somebody. Uh, John Costa. Why don't you share some, I know you've got uh, extensive experience uh, with um, the, the challenges that uh, the operators have brought to your attention. So could you share some of the ideas around uh, how to remind the passengers to wear a mask, what to do uh, when a passenger doesn't wear a mask, and how can we together, when I say we, I'm looking at the federal government as an opportunity, but how can uh, we help you help the workers and help customers do what is right? I believe the agencies have to make our members feel like they care, that they're with them, that they're not going to let them stand out there by themselves. I, I witnessed this in many of my, my career with the fair box uh, with the fair situation and many of our your employees, our members have been assaulted and killed over just trying to collect fares or having making a statement about a fare. So um, this is a good start. I mean, uh, this administration at least is sitting here and listening, listening to us. There's ways to do this. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I sit here and I, I look if, 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 if something like this happens on a plane, you know, the employees there feel safe because, you know, the feds will be on and take a person off like that. No matter of fact, that person will never be able to get back on that plane, right? But when it comes to a bus, it's like we're left out there by ourselves. And if we ask for help, it takes forever. Um, I have operators that ask for help and the police don't even want it. I'm not gonna arrest somebody with a mask. That has to be changed. Our culture has to be changed. Fortunately, it's been so long now because the last administration didn't do I won't curse, I promise. Nothing uh, on this um, and, and pretty much felt that we didn't need it, that there, you know, our members are already dealing with this and have already dealt with the rude customer, the politics on the bus. Uh, it, it's crazy. But, my, but, but, but the challenge is if we don't make the riders feel safe on our equipment, they're not going to come back. It's, it's the cities are not going to come back. We're going to fail. So we have to not only protect our operator and give them the feeling that you're there with us and you're going to back us. And I'm not going to get fired for saying something to somebody or if I get an altercation, you're going to be there with me. Or if I hit the signal saying, you know, help needed because of a mask violation, that person's going to show up. But at the same time, the public's going to need to know that it's safe to get on that bus because they don't want to deal with all this bull either. Uh, and how are you going to get them back? So we're, we're, we're facing a situation that if we want our industry to come back, and like John Samuelson has said, you know, the, the, the agency has to realize that we need to redesign this bus, make it safer, you know, not only with everything I said, but even the design of the workstation, move the door back, you know, put in other doors for, for, for our operator to get out, there's ways we can do this, which we've been pushing for a long time. But with the pandemic, um, you know, my members don't feel totally um, 
convinced that this mandate's going to work and uh, very skeptical of, of uh, how this falls out. I believe a lot of things have been talked about, signs, PA systems, push it out, push it out so they see, but there's going to have to have, we're going to have to have enforcement, we're going to have to have security, police out there to be seen so people know that this is serious and um, they're not going to mess with, you mess with an operator, you don't come on that bus, uh, they'll be taken off the bus and not only taken off the bus, but maybe never allowed to come back on the bus. Yeah. Um, Greg, did you have some other thoughts to add to what John and Holly had said? Uh, I would actually defer to John Samuelson if you if he has something you'd like to share here. John Samuelson. Well, yeah, I would. I'm I'm listening to the um, just the suggestion that um, Polly Hansen from after I hope I got your name right made about best efforts um, rather than must enforce and you know, we totally disagree with that. It, once the FTA include put in, puts language in place that says best efforts, the employees are going to do whatever they want. They're going to they're just going to do whatever the hell they want, particularly the private employers, not the not the public sector run systems. It has to be a must enforcement. I think the, the FDA has to step in and figure out a way to mandate enforcement right now. Otherwise, really, there's no change. It just becomes a piece of paper and, and no change from the previous administration. So what looks good on paper, if there's not an enforcement mechanism, that is is just doesn't require the companies to make best efforts, then it's somewhat useless. We'll have companies like SEPTA and particularly the private carriers that run public transit for various transit agencies are just gonna do whatever they want. There, ha there has to be enforcement um, and there has to be a way to figure out as has been touched on many times before, there has to be a way, a way to figure out how to get the onus absolutely off frontline transit workers. There, there's a, I'm sure everybody is aware there's an absolute full moon atmosphere in public transit right now. It's downright scary, as scary as I've ever seen it in the 28 years I've been here to ride public transit. And the, the, the mask mandate, it must be enforced. It can't just be best efforts. So I think in a nutshell, really, that's my biggest concern of all the conversation that I've heard. Yeah, okay. And, and Sonia, as we are wrapping this uh, segment up, um, You've heard several of the uh, participants touch on enforcement and um, leveraging the, uh, the resources uh, that either they have or that the federal government through TSA can bring to bear. Uh, of course, transit is a little different than the aviation industry, but uh, the example that was provided in terms of how TSA reacts on, uh, on airplane versus how they could or may react on a transit system. Any thoughts here? It, it, it is different in aviation, um, and they have been pretty uh, pretty aggressive. Um, uh, it, it's a very different environment, uh, and we uh, do have federal air marshals that are on those, uh, but their flight crews are also trained to engage uh, in those cases. Mm -hmm. So our, our surface transportation partners do deal with a different uh, situation. And, and we recognize that enforcement of this uh, really is gonna require some local support. One, um, one thing that might be considered is on a local level to look for the kind of support uh, that can be provided by your uh, local legislators because we are aware that some police departments have indicated that they don't have the authority to enforce this regulation because it's a civil regulation. So, um, you know, looking uh, inward and uh, determining what kind of support can be obtained uh, through the local jurisdictions is I think uh, it, it's a good idea, but the, the campaign to make people aware, the more signage, the better, so that people can't say they didn't know when they were approaching a, a bus or a train to, to board. Uh, more signage is better, uh, indicating that it is now, you know, it's part of the requirement uh, the more that we do that, I think 
some of those incidents can be uh, prevented with, with people knowing that this is not optional. Yes. Uh, well, I guess there's going to be a continued conversation around this. Greg, um, any final thoughts before I turn to the next panel? I didn't want to leave you out. Sure. Well, I would just say, I mean, <clears throat> I think you heard clearly from, from uh, John and John about the need to have real enforcement from people. Uh, you know, it can't just be a, an honor system here. That, that, that's not, that, that doesn't work. Um, but I also would encourage you as, you know, as you continue to look at, uh, at how this is working and, and, and what, what best practices are used, make sure that you're talking to the unions on the ground who are experiencing this day to day, to day and understand they, they're hearing from their members directly about what is working, what isn't working, how bad compliance may or may not be. Um, I think it's important that you use not just the operators, but the, but the unions and hearing directly from the workers to make sure you understand um, what needs to happen that isn't happening and where, where the enforcement is either working or falling short. And I, I just think that that is a level of engagement that I think is off too far too often um, missed when you're when you're hearing directly from the people who are doing the work themselves. So I would just encourage you to continue to talk to uh, ATU, TWU, and other uh, transit unions, and do it on the local level as well. So that would be my uh, my request. That, that's a great suggestion and uh, one that we have uh, noted. So I want to take this opportunity again to thank you all. This uh, this is a very important conversation. We'll continue this dialogue. Uh, Please, um, as you encounter more opportunities, more practices, uh, continue to share those with us so that we can post them on our FAQs on the transit mask up at dot.gov. Uh, again, thanks to all of you for sharing your knowledge. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Matt, who is gonna walk us through the halls to the next round table. Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank all. you all. Thank you. So as we're gathering our next roundtable group, uh, I just wanna remind everyone of more FTA online resources that are available. Uh, the first one is FTA's COVID-19 recovery discussion form. You can see it on the uh, screen right now. And it provides a platform for peer-to-peer -peer exchanges on ideas, uh, practices, other information that transit agencies are using right now to recover from the public health emergency. And then FTA also has a COVID-19 response practices in transit resource that provides some links to practices implemented by transit systems across the country responding to COVID-19. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I wanna highlight that as was noted earlier, the National Transit Institute uh, is providing a virtual course uh, supported with funding by FTA on assault awareness and prevention for transit operators. And these virtual courses uh, quickly filled up when they became available last week. So we are pleased to offer seven additional offerings right now. Um, we're going to uh, move to the second round table here in a moment. So uh, with people ready to roll, I'm gonna turn it back over to our acting administrator, Nuria Fernandez. Okay, and thanks again, uh, Matt. So here we are uh, now uh, joining us on our round table for transit CEOs. We have Barbara Klein, who is the president of Prairie Hills Transit in Spearfish, South Dakota. And she is the current board chair of the Community Transportation Association of America. Also uh, joining us is Tom Lambert. He is the president and CEO of the Houston Metro. Leslie Richards, general manager of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, known as SEPTA. And Paul Wiedefell, who is the general manager and CEO of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, or WMATA. So uh, again, the instructions are that uh, you introduce uh, some brief remarks uh, of your organization experiences and actions, and you had an opportunity to listen to the labor panel. Uh, so if you want to expand on some of the things that were said and what you are doing on, on your own properties uh, to that regard, it would be really helpful. So with that, uh, I'm gonna ask Barbara if you would be first. I appreciate the opportunity to speak for uh, rural operators around the nation. Um, our challenges, I think, are a little bit different than what we heard earlier from the labor unions. Our system specifically operates in a 16,500 square mile area. So um, population densities are not what um, they are in the large urban areas. 
um, I spoke with a number of our agencies in South Dakota this morning, just because I wanted to give you not just my picture, but a picture of what transit agencies in our state are seeing, um, as well as, as a little bit of the discussion from our CTAA members. But um, our challenges have been very minor compared to what we heard earlier. Um, we've been requiring masks since mid-February, early March of 2020. Uh, we had a lot of these um, mandates in place, if you will. Our drivers were required to wear masks early on, and that was when you couldn't get masks. So as I told Nuria a couple weeks ago, um, I was at my sewing machine for lots of days making masks so I could make sure our drivers could wear masks. And we had some extras for passengers to make sure that we could keep everyone safe. And and I know my story is not um, just specific to Western South Dakota, but um, we have provided masks for people. We now are able to order masks. Um, FTA helped us out with a shipment um, months ago. Um, we have provided lots of signage. Uh, we've had great cooperation from our communities. Um, my governing board is, is made up of different um, community members. And so from that standpoint, um, I have a superintendent of schools, a couple mayors, um, folks that are involved very closely with a mask up mandate, um, even before FTA came out with theirs. So um, our role goal has been um, safety, 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 both for the drivers and our passengers. And, and I'm really proud to say that um, we have done an above average job, I think. Um, we haven't had threats. We've, we've seen appreciation. We've seen a little frustration, as you can imagine. But all in all, it's, it's not been a bad process for us. So um, speaking for fellow South Dakotans and, and uh, the way we've done things, um, we're, we're in good shape right now. And I, I can talk more later as we go if you have other questions. Thank you, uh, Barbara, I appreciate that. And um, so next we have Tom Lambert and Tom, like uh, Polly Henson on our previous panel, also was a chief of police uh, and um, now general manager CEO, so Tom. Well, Administrator Fernandez, thank you for the opportunity and the Federal Transit Administration for really bringing this roundtable together. I think it's very important that we do work as partners and how we're continuing to take care of the employees that provide an essential service to the community, those that use our services to get to the essential jobs. And again, we're very proud. So I'm very appreciative to have the opportunity to speak today. I want to begin by thanking my union, the Transport Workers Union of America, particularly Local 260 and their president, Horace Mars, because we have a partnership and the things we do to uh, provide the essential services to our community, we don't do that in a vacuum, we do it in partnership. And so I'm very appreciative of their efforts to make sure that we stay focused on the things we need to be focused on. And I want to spend just a couple of minutes to talk about the things we've done and build a bit about what Barbara has said. You know, we really at Houston Metro uh, began to see the need to make sure that we were following all the Center for Disease Control guidelines uh, back in March. And that really focused to include mask. Uh, so we began to encourage our customers, along with all of us that operated the system, uh, to make sure that we were following not only the social distancing requirements, we did all the things that we were encouraged to do, but we focused also in encouraging people to wear a mask on the system. Our board of directors then saw the significant importance and back in June, they passed a health and safety rule that allowed us to mandate uh, the wearing a mask on our system. So we've done the mandatory requirements uh, going back to June. But in advance of that, we also saw the need not to do this from a standpoint of being punitive, but being helpful. And so we issued masks to those customers that did not have a mask. And since uh, really going back to March, we've handed out over 2 million facial masks to our customers. 
Uh, we started the high about 15,000 a day. Uh, we're down to about 5,000 a day and want to continue to reinforce that. And we think that's an extremely important thing to do. So when the Transportation Security Administration came out with their security directive on February the 1st, what that really did is just reinforce the importance of everything we were doing on the system in Houston that we've seen done across the country. And I wanna compliment APTA and all the leadership that they've taken on the health and safety commitments that they've made and the systems that have also joined into that commitment uh, and all things we're doing. So when the federal mandate came out, we wanted to continue our focus to continue and encourage and educate and really inform uh, individuals why it was so important to do so. We wanted to make sure we were reducing barriers so no one could uh, not be available to wear masks and that's why we've handed them out. We've done every form of education and announcements, whether it's the, the hard media, social media, digital bulletin boards at our facilities, uh, service alerts to all of our customers, signage, uh, car cards, announcements on the system, continue to reinforce that to show the importance following the message of public health officials and why this is so important for us to do in supporting our community. So we're, we're very comfortable with what we're doing, but we did not want to place the burden on our operators of being the enforcers. That's not their job. And so we did establish a protocol that if someone comes on the system and is not in compliance, the operator is to notify control. And Tom, you had mentioned this earlier, uh, we stop the bus, we give them the opportunity to come in compliance. If they don't come in compliance, the bus does not continue until we get a service supervisor or police officer to respond to get that compliance. And that compliance can come from either complying with the, the rule or you exit the service. And I'm very appreciative that we've not had a lot of incidents uh, that we've had to respond to, but we take this very seriously. We wanna make sure that it is a public health need, that we make sure that we do our part to take care of not only our customers and the broader community, but those individuals that operate our service. And so our Metro Police have done all the things we need to do to make sure that we're in compliance with the security directive, whether it's someone that is not uh, meeting the requirements and fail to comply, and if it meets that threshold of a significant incident, we'll be reporting that to the TSA Security Operations Center. Fortunately, we've not had that yet, uh, but we'll be making sure that we do that. So the more we do to work together, uh, and Madam Administrator, your leadership in bringing this group together, because we are in this together, and the more we can learn from each other and how we're gonna support our colleagues who operate the service, and our customers who need this essential service is extremely important. So thank you again for the opportunity to participate. Yes, and thank you, uh, Tom, for joining us and for sharing um, that protocol that you all have instituted. So with that, I'm gonna turn now to Leslie Richards uh, at SEPA. Leslie? Sure, um, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Acting Administrator Fernandez, for inviting me to participate in this very important conversation and for the FTA's ongoing efforts to lead the nation's transit agencies through this extremely unprecedented and challenging time. FTA has been an invaluable partner since the beginning of the pandemic. And I wanted to thank Terry Garcia Cruz and her team at Region 3 for their proactive guidance and assistance. Um, also, uh, just as Tom said, wanna thank our local TWU 234 for ongoing discussions and seeing how we can best um, deal with the challenges that this pandemic has presented uh, for all of us. I do wanna say that SEPTA has been impacted in a real way. We have lost 10 members of our SEPTA family uh, to COVID-19 and we have had a thousand uh, positives uh, among our, our um, team as well. I'm glad to report that nearly 70% have fully recovered and are back to work. Um, Customer and employee safety have always been uh, number one priorities for us here at SEPTA. And the pandemic has increased the scope of what that means for us. We pivoted quickly to develop enhanced cleaning and disinfecting measures, establishing social distancing protocols, installing operator protective barriers in our vehicles and conducting employee temperature screenings. Uh, we also provide free COVID tests for all of our employees. 
and we implemented a system-wide mask requirement. Since last spring, SEPTA has required all employees and customers to wear face masks on our vehicles and in our stations and at all of our facilities. We've worked hard to reinforce our mask requirement through awareness, information, and engagement. Last July, we introduced our social distancing coaches program. And in January, we launched Mask Force Philly as part of a regional initiative with New York's MTA, New Jersey Transit, and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, as well as with Amtrak. With Mask Force Philly, SEPTA employee volunteers and transit stakeholders are deploying throughout the system to positively engage our customers and distribute masks. We wanna thank the FTA and FEMA for providing the masks that we are handing out to customers in need. And I'm proud to say that the vast majority of SEPTA riders are doing their part. Compliance rates have consistently been over 90% with as many as 97% wearing masks. However, the, the 90 to 90% uh, difference is some are not wearing them correctly. And so we are working very carefully uh, to reach those remaining five to 10% of riders who are not fully complying with the mask mandate. We are focusing on ensuring that our operators and our other frontline personnel are not placed in confrontational situations, just like we've heard from our other speakers here. We wanna do everything to avoid any assaults or any dangerous or confrontational behaviors. I do wanna mention before I conclude uh, my comments here, but at the same time as we were dealing with mask uh, compliance, you know, our resources are stretched thin because as the pandemic has heightened the health and safety challenges, related to our vulnerable population here in Southeastern Pennsylvania, those experiencing homelessness and opioid use uh, disorders. Uh, they're seeking shelter and they're seeking shelter on our system. So I know SEPT is not alone in addressing these issues and I look forward to sharing our experiences, learning from our transit community, working with our labor leaders uh, to achieve FTA's goal, which is also our goal, which is for the successful implementation of the CDC order. So thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you for joining us, Leslie. And we look forward to the, the discussion that's going to ensue right after uh, Paul Wiedefill from WMATA uh, shares his remarks. Paul? Hi, Nuria. Uh, thank you again for, for inviting us all. Um, I see we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'll be very, very brief. Um, First and foremost, I think it's very important that you keep labor engaged in all these discussions. I also would suggest that maybe we broaden a little bit and bring in some of the labor unions that represent uh, police force, police, uh, whether we have our own force or we rely on other police, uh, because I think it's, uh, they're dealing with the same issues we're dealing with, to be frank, and some of the issues you just heard from, from uh, the other labor leaders. That'd be one suggestion. I think uh, Leslie hit on one big issue, I think, which is, you know, the, when it's a black and white issue, it's fairly, you know, it's fairly clear. If someone doesn't have a mask, they refuse to put one on, you know, it gets elevated fairly quickly. Uh, there's a lot of gray areas, uh, you know, in this business. Um, so basically someone that gets on a, on a system and then decides either to pull the mask down or starts talking without it or whatever you do. And uh, it's not unique to us. Uh, you watch any sporting event, it's very hard to find a coach that doesn't literally pull down their mask to talk to their players and then put it back on, which I don't quite understand. They scream with it off and then they put it back on and they don't talk. So, I mean, this isn't unique to us. So you see it play out on our, on our system. And also we have to recognize that we have, we deal with the entire community, right? We deal with everyone that comes on that, on that bus or on a rail system and they bring lots of things with them. A lot of them have emotional and, and mental health issues and that's a reality, right? And they, and they may not even, you know, all the advertising, all the signs and all, it doesn't resonate, right? There's, there's something else going on there. So we have to recognize that as, as, as part of the equation. I think it's very important that we keep, always keep in mind that this is a public health issue, right? We're not police, we're not, we're, our operators are not uh, enforcement police. This is dealing with a public health issue, so we need to engage the entire community to do that. One example of, of something that we've done in, in Washington, we joined with a group called Black Coalition Against COVID. And basically it's, just, it's a, a group of um, health workers um, faith, uh, faith people from the faith community, community organizers, and we partnered with them to th what else can we be doing together 
to get people when they use public transit to use masks and then obviously to use in other places. And one of the things we've done with them is we look particularly at the younger people. And what is it that, so we literally created a partnership with them where we could have created focus groups where we said, what is it that you miss now that the pandemic's here? And we listened to them. And then we said, okay, now what is the message then you would send to your cohort to get them to understand the way to get to those things that you want is to wear the mask. So we're actually creating a whole campaign around that. So we've got a, I mean, that's just one example, but we all need to think of different ways, again, to get the public health message out of this. We're not doing this as a penalty. We're doing this because we're all in this together. And the sooner we get out of it, the sooner we all get back to where we want to be. So that's sort of the approach we're trying to get, uh, trying to move towards, again, and not putting our frontline people into an enforcement role because it's just not, it's not, it's not their job. They're not trained for it. We can do all the, all the, um, you know, try, trying to get them to, you know, bring things down in temperature. Yes, we do that. But at the end of the day, basically, that is not their job. Uh, so I'll stop, stop there because I know you're up against the clock. Thank you so well, much again for inviting us. Well, well thank you, Paul, because um, one of the things that you've done is to share um, an effective practice, and that is engaging the community uh, and getting to where the community is and, and bringing in the younger generation. Uh, who is most likely to use public transportation if they're not driving. Uh, so now let's just uh, broaden this conversation. We heard from labor, uh, we've heard from TSA uh, about what they are doing and what they have made available to all of the transit operators. Uh, and, and you know what we, are, what we have been doing at, at the Federal Transit Administration, uh, providing funding so that is available to all of our transit uh, grant recipients. And it's, flex, it's funding that they can use uh, to not only protect the workers, but also to uh, provide masks and they can provide masks to customers. Um, so what more can we do at the federal level? And I'm saying that, uh, so this is our opportunity to draw from what happened in the panel prior to yours. And then some of the things you've heard here. Is there, is, are there any other areas that uh, we should be considering um, can we do more uh, helping with the uh, with the, the messaging, uh, with posters? I don't know. I'm just kind of looking to you all for how can we help? So let me start with Barbara. Thank you. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the parallels that we've seen is that we provide a significant amount of transportation for school-aged children so mom and dad can get to work and, and uh, so forth. But um, while we're requiring our children to wear masks on the bus, the yellow buses are not requiring children to wear masks on the bus. So, um, you know, that, that's one situation we've seen. Parents have called and said, you know, if my kids rode the yellow school bus, they wouldn't have to wear masks. Why are you making them? And so, you know, we explain, and of course we do it in a very kind and compassionate way, but um, my five-year-old grandson went home and told his dad the other day that uh, I'm wearing my mask on the bus and it would be a Prairie Hills Transit bus because Joe Biden said I needed to. And when dad said, well, who's Joe Biden? The little boy didn't know, my grandson didn't know, but um, presenting that to children and, and having them understand conceptually why we're asking them to wear a mask is a little bit of a challenge. And I realize that's not the biggest thing we have going here, but um, consistency, you know, we've, we've hit planes, trains, automobiles and buses but yellow buses still seem to be kind of out there and, and there are no requirements for them. So that would be one of the considerations um, that, that we have talked about. And um, to that point on the consistency, that's something I know Sonia is taking notes on that too, because it does come up regularly and that could be the subject of its own panel. Uh, but um, that same question I'm gonna pose to the other three, uh, I'll, I can, go in order or I can just ask Tom since he... Uh, Madam Administrator, I'll start. And, and what you're doing today, I think, is a good example. Uh, information sharing, uh, where you can pile best practices. A lot of systems are doing things that 
uh, quite frankly, the opportunity to bring that all together, to share, everybody can get some value out of that exercise. I think sitting down having a working task force, if you will, uh, of labor operators, uh, law enforcement, as Paul said, I think it really begins to frame what the real uh, challenges are and then the opportunities of how we can go forward in the longer term to address them. Because we're talking mass today, but I think Leslie made a very good point. Uh, there's a lot of societal issues that transit is really caught in the middle of. And the more we can identify those issues and have a longer term strategy, whether it's training, uh, operations, vehicle design, all the things we've been talking about today, that can be a tremendous benefit of continuing to progress the industry and serving communities. So information sharing opportunities to really identify the problems going forward would be a extremely important thing. And thanks again for the funding you're bringing. Uh, that's a very important area to, to do the things we need to do as well. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, let's go to Leslie and then we'll wrap up with Paul. Leslie? Sure. Um, I, I agree that this discussion is is fantastic. And, you know, there are so many uh, different and, and diverse transit agencies. Um, we are all so different. Our, we're a legacy agency with many access points. I mean, I know Paul's agency also um, has, has a long history, but they don't have the access issues that we have and how we are spread out. So we all have different challenges and the way that we can help each other and share ideas. Um, again, this conversation, I hope it's just the beginning of us all helping each other. And also there are some, some very big um, it challenges that we have that is going, transit should be part of the solution, but we can't be the only ones uh, coming up with the solution because as Tom just said, the problem is, is so big. And so we would love to have those conversations as well. Um, as uh, uh, transit workers are able to get vaccines, I think FTA can do a good job in also getting the message out that masks should be continued to be required even after the vaccines. There has been some um, discussion on that. And I also wanted to thank you for working um, with uh, NTI, the National Transit uh, Institute uh, for their uh, assault awareness and prevention uh, courses uh, for our frontline workers, our employees and our supervisors. It's been truly helpful, uh, but a way that uh, it could be even more helpful if, if it would be made um, available online. Um, not all of our uh, frontline and uh, supervisors can get uh, to the classes when they're offered. So maybe um, expanding and, and how that they could be, um, how they could be used and watched. And uh, again, how uh, they could be helpful. Great, okay, we've noted that as well. Thank you, Leslie. And Paul, why don't you bring it home? Uh, just very quickly, I wanted to um, recognize Sonia and her, her great help, uh, everything she does. and. Uh, she knows, um, you know, I, I actually uh, ran an airport for eight years. And so I think it's a point that we have to make sure that, you know, we don't have monolithic, you know, uh, approaches here. The, the reality is aviation is, is so different, you know, than, than transit. And we have to recognize it. And then within the transit arena, as Leslie just mentioned, I mean, the, the, the world that Barbara lives on in, in and the issue she's dealing with is totally different than ones that I'm dealing with and vice versa. So I think we need some flexibility to understand that and different approaches will work in different environments. Uh, you know, and I think that's a good thing, you know, that we remain flexible in that way. So I think any flexibility you can give us as we work through these issues and understanding that something that works here may work somewhere else, but it may not. And we need to make sure that we're constantly keeping that type of communication open so that we can get the best of everything and not apply something because it worked over here that now everyone should follow that same, same, same lead because it may not work at all. So thank you so much again for inviting us. Well, I, I want to thank all of you because you have shared some really important uh, insights into what it, what it is to be on the ground uh, running a transit agency or sitting behind um, the the wheel of a bus or the, in the cab of a train. Uh, today's two panels have been invaluable, uh, provided invaluable information. So thanks to the first panel and to this panel for sharing your time uh, and the experiences. And of course, uh, I want to thank all of our participants uh, in the audience joining us through Zoom today. We've had uh, as high as 450 people on this call. Uh, under Secretary Buttigieg's uh, leadership, the Biden administration is going to continue to make safety our number one priority uh, through the, throughout the transit industry, and all of you are going to help us do that. 
So again, uh, by working together is how we're going to be able to implement this requirement. The more ideas, the more challenges you encounter and solutions that you come up with, there's no solution that's too small uh, that would not benefit all. So just continue to share them. And I am confident that our dedication and commitment will keep transit workers safe and our passengers safe. So I look forward to hosting our, my next uh, call uh, with all of you on uh, February 23rd at 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And we're going to feature answers to many of the questions that we will receive from today's panel discussions, as well as those questions that have been coming in throughout the week. So until then, uh, please continue sending those questions to our DOT website uh, for updated uh, FAQs. Uh, be safe, and thanks to all of you. I'll turn it back to Matt to conclude. Thank you, Nuri. Everyone, uh, this concludes today's session. Thank you very much for joining us.